Hi, it's world exclusive teardown time. We've got the brand new Tektronics 2 series oscilloscope released today. Links are down below. And this one what is a qualification build. So there might be slight differences with the final production version. I haven't heard, I don't think so, but just be aware of that. This one was actually hand carried over here by Tektronics and I'll link up here and down below uh, my initial reaction video to this and also a talk with uh, Andy Ted about the design of this thing. We talked for about 40 minutes just before he had to hop on a plane about the uh, design and build of this thing. So let's check it out. Isn't that just gorgeous? I love the stand on this thing. It's just fantastic. And yes, we will tear down the uh, optional battery pack for this thing as well. So let's get rid of the stand and Let's get into it. And the cover for the battery pack here, this actually fits into a slot on the uh, battery pack. So um, yeah, it's just off. Uh, we've got the visa mounts, uh, of course, and these are the battery pack uh, clip ones as well. But I guess you could use those for mounting if you really wanted to. But you know, these are standard visa mounts. So absolutely brilliant. So you can see the tablet-like form factor of this thing, even though it's not actually a uh, tablet uh, scope. It's more of a new concept, thin portable bench scope, uh, which you can, uh, you know, mount on various visa mounts, and then you can convert it into a portable scope if you want using the external battery pack. So it looks like it's going to be really easy to get into. It just got some torque screws around here and they did say that one of their uh, design uh, aspects of this thing is that it is all single board construction so and that may have led to design decisions like the uh, lack of the tech uh, TPI uh, probe interface here because you were uh, like most likely would have required a second uh, you know board in there just for the uh, connections uh, for the active uh, probes and also why they went with the membrane keypad instead of uh, your regular buttons which then have to be deeper and then probably probably on a uh, secondary board, but let's find out by taking it apart. And looks like these are all self-tappers into plastic, so that's a bit disappointing. I expected some metal threaded inserts there. Come on, I mean, you know, this is not bottom of the barrel pricing, although, you know, for tech it is. Is it just going to lift off? Dunno. Have I forgotten any? Is there another one in the middle? What's going on? Uh, is there a sneaky bugger under there? There's four sneaky buggers under there! Look at that! Is that like a big heatsink under there or something? It just seems weird and they're offset from the center so it's almost as if it's like an operational PCB heatsink thing instead of like being an external design that's driven by the PCB layout in there. That'd be my guess. So this is where the PCB designer might have actually uh, driven the or had to feed back to the mechanical case designers what they actually wanted. Um, so, anyway, there we go. There we go. Okay. Ready? Ta-da! No, I'm wrong! What? No, I'm not wrong, actually. Um, I just expected to see a big, uh, like, metalwork under here. But you can see that the screws have uh, gone into, you can see that all the bypass caps in there and all those uh, vias, those tiny little vias, that, of course, will be the main FPGA under there. Could be the acquisition, no, the acquisition engine's probably down here, near the front end like this, but there you go. That is um, an entire single board construction. Isn't that, isn't that neat and groovy? And it's actually um, smaller than this whole thing, because I'm sure one of the uh, complaints will be this thing, oh, why do I need an external battery pack? Um, that was my one of my original thoughts as well. Um, it, well, it's not only for a capacity reason. I mean, this thing is, you know, it is relatively thin, but there are, of course, tablet oscilloscopes on the market that actually um, have internal batteries, and they actually work as tablet oscilloscopes, because by the time you add the battery pack to this thing, it is quite thick. It's no longer sort of a tablet-y uh, form factor. So, ooh. There you go. Got a pin sticking up there. What's that doing? Ah, they've got another pin over here as well. And uh, by the way, that is not actually connected through to any sort of, uh, you know, shielding on the back. There's no nickel screening. Um, it, it, this doesn't look, uh, you know, conductive or, or screened at all. The back plastic on that. So 
that's interesting. Um, but of course, you've got the back side of the board, not the front side. But from an a EMC point of view, that's just rather interesting, isn't it? But uh, we do have uh, the shield on the uh, front end, though. But that's a, that's a very narrow front end. Wow. And you can see this uh, button side here. This is where all the membrane buttons are. You can see that if they use the one PCB, then they would have that you couldn't have any components on there at all. You would have to like all the circuitry would have to be on this part of the board, and you'd have to leave at least on the uh, top side anyway. You'd have to leave. The, you'd have to mount all this on the bottom. So there's obviously a whole bunch of chips down here. This is the uh, logic analyzer inputs, all the logic analyzer stuff. You could have mounted it on the back side, so they could have, maybe they could have done it. I don't know, I'd have to actually get the PCB files and actually, you know, play around with it and spend a lot of time playing around with this thing from a, uh, you know, a layout engineer uh, point of view. But you can see that the USBs are on the front, but even then, like, yeah, you would have had to clear out the entire front part of this PCB here uh, to get uh, your buttons just on the uh, front, on the single board. If you're, you know, were so desperate to get this as a single board uh, construction, then, which they obviously were, um, I've been told it is single board and it looks like it. Looks like they don't have anything else under it, so we'll take it all out and have a squiz, of course, but um, yeah. Anyway, this is interesting. Here's our big grounding point over here, because here's our big, you know, they're serious about their mains earth connection, and it gives you a warning when you boot the thing up. Um, I don't know, don't know if you can disable, it's rather annoying, actually. Please ensure the earth terminal is connected, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, they've gone to town on that. Look at that. That's absolutely uh, beautiful. It's all heat shrunk down there. But this was one of my... Uh, original uh, things that I uh, thought about and you'll see this in my other in my reaction uh, video I believe and like why does it have to be on the side why couldn't you've had it on the back there are some scenarios where having the power connector on the side like this um, is beneficial but there's other uh, ones where you don't want it sticking out the side you want it coming out the back or you want at least a right angle connector but it's not a right angle connector it's actually the one supplied is um, just an inline jobby like that but I guess the good news about that is if you bugger up your connector, you can actually replace it. So I do hope they actually sell this um, as a replacement part um, and or make it, you know, well, it's obviously um, easily serviceable. So yeah. So that is one of the things I wanted to check. Like I would have been disappointed if this was a, a right angle uh, PCB mount uh, thing because like, you know, like a big part of this, especially if you're doing it every day, the uh, fatigue of actually, uh, you know, actually connecting this connector in and out, it could uh, wear out over time. Of course, that is a distinct possibility, but I did notice it was actually uh, screwed in there like that. So no worries, but uh, yeah, they've got actually a, quite a significant amount of space around here and up the top as well. So I guess in theory, you know, you could have shoved some like 18650s or or something up there for those who are uh, complaining about, yeah, why doesn't it have built-in batteries? Well, you know, technically it would have been possible, but this thing's like 50-odd uh, watts. I think the uh, brick is about 60 watts or so uh, maximum. I haven't measured the actual power draw, but yeah, you're not going to get much uh, usage out of this if you just put some 18650s along here or something like that. You know, you could have maybe had like a plastic cover on top of this and then a thin layer of uh, pouch cells or something like that, but then the design gets a bit tricky and then you've got to have you know, then you can't get the screws through to do this uh, sort of stuff and eh. Technically, I'm a bit disappointed with uh, this because these visa mounts, I probably expected like a big bit of metal work in here, but it's not. It's just the uh, back plastic uh, backing and uh, no metal threaded inserts for these screws. But, you know, this thing doesn't weigh you know, a heck of a lot just on its own like this. So putting it on a visa arm, it's not a huge amount of stress. This plastic's going to take it. It's just, I just expected like a metal bracket in there or something, but you know, you want to get the weight down. So yeah, fair enough. And attention to detail here by the PCB designer. Backside flip latch like this. Um, you can almost see this coming about because oh, the PCB designer went, oh yeah, people are going to come a guts uh, with this one thinking that, oh, you know, we're going to flip it like this or we're going to pull it out or whatever. But no, it's a backside flippity doo -dah like that. So really appreciate that as a PCB designer. And the shield for the front end, it just uh, lifts off. They've got a whole bunch of uh, clips in here, but it just clips off. And interestingly, um, they really didn't need 
these raised bumps on here, I guess they might have uh, changed. I guess that was uh, designed and thought about at the time when they didn't know exactly what uh, you know front panel B and C connector that they were going to use. But you can see that it's not raised there at all. It's the same as the uh, ground, the center pin is the same as the surrounding pins there. So it doesn't really protrude at all. So maybe they designed that, uh, chain, made a change to that, um, you know, a bomb change to that uh, BNC connector later and it doesn't have a big center pin sticking out, which is what you'd need these things for. And they do come out quite a long way, but yeah, they're actually not needed. And this is going to be a very simplistic front end. In fact, I haven't seen one like a 500 meg front end this small because it is software bandwidth uh, definable of course so anywhere from 70 megahertz up to 500 meg uh, we've got a relay here and we've got our uh, input resistor here and a couple of you know passive jobbies and stuff like that but yeah it looks like this is not going to probably not going to be a huge amount on the other side because well it only goes covers this little small section here it's really remarkable but you know that's the advancement in technology over the years i'd love to compare this with like the original mso uh 2000 unfortunately i used to have one of those donkeys years ago but i don't anymore so unfortunately uh, maybe i can see some get some teardown photos or something but i don't think it went to 500 meg but yeah ah these newfangled front ends so from a product design point of view i can really appreciate wanting to have this all on one board and not have to dick around and have board interconnects and everything else uh, to lower the price. And you can see how that decision might have driven uh, some of the design decisions. I mean, once we get this out, uh, you know, we might see, okay, well, maybe they didn't have room for the uh, tech interface because that will be one of the big uh, complaints about this as well. All the other series had them and the original um, MSO 2000, which this one is actually replacing uh, completely. I don't believe they're selling it um, after this is actually released. Um, well, as of today that I'm releasing this video, then, and yeah, it, it had tech TPI interface. So that will be a big complaint. But uh, a lot of those decisions will be driven from, you know, they made the call. We want this single board construction. So therefore, eh, it's going to drive these d design decisions like the buttons and the TPI interface and other things. And I always appreciate the uh, PCB and mechanical uh, teams working together. You can see that uh, they went to the effort to just do a little rounded out bit there um, just to allow these cables to come out, even though they didn't need to. Um, they've just gone to the effort there. Nice. So from a servicing point of view, if they are going to actually um, service these things, then yeah, like you've just got a couple of connectors around the outside like this. It's very clean. Uh, looks like we've got the backlight uh, connectors or is that uh, touch or whatever? Um, I don't know. Um, but yeah, we've got just a couple of connectors around the outside like this and nice attention to detail about how to get them off. And I think once all these screws come out, it's just going to pop open and it's going to be a very simplistic and clean design. And I really appreciate that. So it looks like under here, we are actually going to get our metal bracket because this I can see it bend under and I can see some metal under there there's another one poking up here and that'll hold the screen in so that's actually acting uh, as because it's dissipating a fair bit of power and it's got the uh, passive uh, cooling vents on here like this um, which aren't anywhere near the metal but you know it, it doesn't really matter and it looks like that yeah they're going to get away with one PCB so maybe they, that they got so sick of uh, like maybe the complexity of existing builds in like the MSO 2000 or something that they went right we're going ultra simplistic one board for everything and it looks like possibly one big metal bracket for everything as well which does the heat sinking and does the mounting of the screen and the pressure and all sorts of stuff so I think we're going to see this um, clean simple design manifest itself in the rest of this and this is a stark contrast to uh, other scope designs were torn apart which have then a back metal case and a front metal case and then they've got a bit of metal work for here and there and everywhere so now I'm taking out all the ones labeled PT but there's two others here labeled M3 so I'm going to assume that that is the heat sink in there so I'm not going to take out those I'm just going to take out the PTs around here and I think our whole board and front panel assembly should lift out so here we go I've got all the PT screws out and will this sucker lift out? No, no, have I missed one? Or I might have to take out these M3s. And they're numbered one and two. Like there's no B and C rings. So, um, yeah, come on. 
And these are metal threaded inserts, as I suspected, because I reckon there's a heatsink under that bad boy. Let's try it again, shall we? No, I still can't lift it. Oh, silly me. I've got to undo this and the whole bracket's going to come out. <laughs> Doll. Aha, that actually clips out of the front like that. So, yep, 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 there it is. <laughs> That's kind of obvious when you think about it. I've put those uh, screws back there. I completely forgot my knobs. Always remember your knobs. They're very important. So this bad boy should now just lift off. That's the... That's the theory anyway. Ta-da! There you go. Beautiful! Look at that. Yep, one big metal bracket. I was right. And that's all she wrote. And, oh, interestingly, there's our fans. Okay, we've got three lots of um, RF connecting sponge here, which connect down to the metal backing plate of your LCD, which is in there like that. So we've got two blower fans in here, and they blow out the top. Uh-huh. So that explains what this top cavity here is for. It's for ventilation. So that's just to get the air out. That makes sense now. Yeah, no worries. So these two metal pins are stuck into the plastic standoff like that, and they do actually go into the back case. So they're like alignment pins, although that one's that one's uh, not exactly round. So yeah, but that uh, helps when you put in the back case on, I guess. But you know, these would all fall into place. Ooh, you've got to rub those. Uh, I'm not sure why they went to that uh, effort there for that alignment, but obviously someone in production went, hey, you know, it'd be really nice if we had these for alignment when we're actually putting the things down, or maybe they've got uh, li extra alignment pins for, no, it wouldn't be for test fixture after you've put the board in. Maybe, nah, no. Nah. Mm. Our BNCs do actually have the locking nuts. Look at that, that's interesting. And then they've got, um, yeah, like a metal standoff thing. That's, that's fascinating, isn't it? And they're soldered down in the PCB, so that gets extra rigidity. So huge bonus points for the mechanical uh, design of that, which takes some um, stress off the PCBs. If these were just, you know, sticking right out of the PCB, it would have been a bit how you're doing. But no, they've gone to that effort, and they've got these cutouts in here like this with these little prongs, which then just hold the nut in place. So... Um, hats off to the mechanical designer that came up with that. I don't think I've seen that before. And that just um, like is like an anti-vibration thing to stop the nut coming off. That's rather neat, although it's only friction on the top surface of that flat nut. It's not rigidigy or anything, but geez, that's pretty neat, isn't it? And sure enough, there's your two metal threaded insert standoffs, um, M1 and M2. Sure enough, yeah. That just uh, extends down. They've got this uh, welded onto here on the bottom side, so they didn't actually stamp that out. I would have expected them to sort of like stamp it out like they're doing down here. They've obviously got another heatsink down here, not as important as this jobby. Um, but yeah, they've like they've stamped that in, like pressed it in. They haven't done the same here. So, oh, but obviously this would be a low, lower thermal resistance than what they're doing over here. But that's interesting. So. That's your main FPGA. There's your memory, so let me get all that off. But yeah, that's neat, huh? And extra direct uh, shielding going straight over like that. They've uh, put these as press contacts going down this. And once it's all screwed in to place, it's going to make some um, extra RFI contact over here. Neat. And sure enough, you take off these two screws here and it drops away and we've got the entire PCB. And yeah, you can see how these are welded here and it's a thicker uh, plate than just the thinner backing plate we've got here. So this would have a much lower thermal resistance. They did this, um, they would have determined that, yeah, they needed a lower thermal resistance to the uh, heatsink back plate in here than they did with uh, this one down here. So let's check it out. Ta-da! We're in! Look at this! No surprises for finding the Xilinx Zinc uh, FPGA here. We'll have a look at that in a minute. But obviously, uh, we've got two ADCs here. These are off-the-shelf national semiconductor jobbies. We've got our memory here. Now, this thing only has 10 meg of memory. I don't know if that's a limitation. We'll have to look up the part number of these, see what the uh, total memory is here. And then we'd have our boot memory for the FPGA, do we? And then we've got an application processor down here. We'll have a squeeze out, and they're the two ones that they're heat sinking, not, not bother uh, heat sinking the ADCs here. So just off the shelf, um, very little in the way of uh, custom uh, tech logic, although I do believe 
there's a custom tech front end logic under here. Un unfortunately, this is just evil. Um, this uh, plate here doubles as a shielded and that's all soldered down. So to get in there, I'm going to have to desolder this thick, heavy plate here and hope I don't damage a front end. Better do it on channel four or something just in case I goof it. So would it have been possible to uh, move all these parts from here and have a real button interface? Well, you know, look, I mean, there's plenty of uh, room left around here to shuffle all these uh, components up and stuff like that. I know you have to keep your routing short from your front end, but certainly that could have been shuffled over. But then the problem is you've dictated that you've got your connectors on this side of the board. So, you oh, no, you can still drop them down. And then, yeah, nah, not really. Like, you really, like, you could have. I can understand why they've gone for the membrane keyboard. Now, this is interesting. They've got like two rings in here with uh, annotation must cover and may cover. So obviously th this is the real time clock and this is the uh, battery. So this is the positive terminal of the uh, battery on the back side of that. And so obviously they don't want this shorting out to the metal work. So that's just a note from the uh, designer that, you know, look, make sure this terminal doesn't get shorted to anything. So, but there's no like, uh, you know, tape or plastic sheet or anything like that to stop it uh, shielding. They just, you know, a note at the design stage, um, just make sure, you know, it's not close. And then they've got the same note down in here. This is uh, the battery terminals and that the battery pack, pack plugs into. So yeah, you definitely don't want that. But once again, like there's no, um, you know, plastic insulation. So they just determined that the standoff distance is fine. And yeah, that's fine and dandy. But this is the kind of detail that you'd put on your PCB just to uh, aid the other teams, like the mechanical designers who are designing the metalwork backing plate and stuff like that. And the, uh, you know, production team who are figuring out how this thing's going to be assembled for an optimal cost and tested and all that sort of jazz. And, you know, just these notes help uh, to make sure that, you know, you don't goof up something <laughs> down further down uh, the chain that was out of the control of the uh, PCB designers. So that's a, just a nice little bit of uh, cross-design team engineering there. Well, I'm getting there, trying to extract this fr front end can, but uh, it ain't pretty. Hang on, I think I got it. I don't think I lifted any pads. Oh, winner, winner, chicken dinner. And there's the single chip custom ASIC solution for the front end. Like... Single chip, it's amazing. 500 megahertz bandwidth, all in that one custom AC chip, the Tech 026. Now this is actually used in, believe it or not, the, um, what is it, the $500 Tech TBS 2000 series. And I believe it's also used in the uh, Tech 3 series as well, although I haven't done a teardown of that, but I believe it is. Uh, but the higher end uh, Tech ones have a what much, because they've got higher bandwidth, they've got a much uh, newer ASIC in there. It's your typical uh, 500 meg bandwidth variable gain amp. Now, of course, uh, the front end of this, of course, is software licensable upgradable from 70 megahertz to 500 megahertz. And yeah, I know. Yeah, all of them do it. Um, I don't actually know, though, if it's actually done internally at the front end or whether or not it's done after the um, sampling. But anyway, single chip solution. Uh, there is no 75 ohm input impedance um, on this. So we've just got that solid state relay uh, that we saw on the other side. And basically, um, it's just a, like a variable gain amplifier and attenuator on the uh, front end. So it's just a differential output here. Looks like it goes through an anti aliasing uh, filter here and a match length uh, differential pair. They l match it to the other lengths over here. That's why it's got a wiggle, wiggle, wiggle year in there to make sure uh, that the skew time in between channels is the same. And it goes up to our off-the-shelf uh, National Instruments ADC and Bob's your uncle. Um, it's not much to it. Modern 500 meg scope. Jeez, when I was a boy. All right, we haven't done a 4K screen capture in a while, so let's have a look at some high-res photos available on my EV blog Flickr account, linked in down below. It's where I always put my teardown photos if you want to see the high-res stuff. But this is high-res, and I can zoom in. As we saw before, there's not much on the bottom side here. You know, there's a few chippies up here. Of course, there's all the passive bypassing and stuff like that. We've got some regulator action going on here. You can tell that's a regulator by the caps around there uh, like that. You know, we're doing like transistor array down here um, doing something. And uh, we've got some output uh, fusing stuff down here. This is for the uh, generator down here. So the generator is output uh, fused. That doesn't look like a resettable jobby. So um, it, it does 
doesn't mean it's going to blow if you short the output. I think it's more designed if you feed something back in. You know, this is like these will find its way to uh, student labs and yeah, that sort of thing happens. Anyway, that'd be like the 50 ohm output impedance there. Uh, you know, probably got some driver stuff here. I don't know. Anyway, this is the um, ASIC. They've actually got a custom generator ASIC. And this is the backside of the ASIC, which we'll have a look at. And, well, you know, there's not a huge amount. Of course, we saw the bottom of the uh, analog front end here. We've got our relay here. That's our solid state relay. None of that mechanical rubbish. So no clunk for all you clunk fanboys. Um, and that's the AC bypass cap. So that's what that relay obviously does. It does your AC DC uh, bypassing and everything else is done um, in chip or your attenuation or your uh, amplification, everything else. They do conveniently have like test points here, three volts and stuff like that, so that's nice. That looks like our touch interface there. And here's our power input from the uh, side connector here. And um, that's some protection, little protection array or something perhaps. Then we've got an interface here with um, no connections on this bottom side. So I don't know, um, uh, they might be some sort of test interface. I don't think they're JTAG because JTAG's over here. So you got the chippies up there, don't know what they're doing, I couldn't be bothered. I'm not going to go into huge amount of detail um, on the minor stuff, we'll just look at the uh, interesting stuff. Um, that is our battery connection interface with our alignment pin there, nice jobby. And this would all be part of our front panel membrane uh, keypad interface here, so they're just doing some matrix switching or something there perhaps, um, and some protection stuff as well. This is our digital input here, um, they've just got bypassing here, so that's pretty much all she wrote. Like for the bottom side. So let's go to the top side. And you can see why they really wanted to put it on all on one board. It is very neat. Of course, everything is the Xilinx Zinc here. This is an ultra scale job. We'll take a look at the data sheet in a minute. But interestingly, you'll notice that uh, it's actually um, siliconed down. And so is the ASIC for the uh, signal generator. This is the uh, ADG395C and that's their custom ASIC uh, for the, their 50 megahertz arbitrary waveform generator. So it pretty much does everything in here. And there's the uh, SIG gen out there. And K, is that a relay there? Oh, look at that, shielded relay too. Mm -hmm. And this most likely also handles the pattern generator output here. It's not a hugely complex pattern generator, but it's almost certainly in there, surely. Um, and the probe compensation uh, output here, although we've got some separate chips here for probe compensation. So I don't know, haven't checked the features. Maybe it just does like, you know, one kilohertz output or whatever. And I check this again, it's not silicon, it's actually um, hot snot uh, glue or some sort of hot snotty type thing. And um, this would have been added after they uh, reflowed the chip because you want the chip floating when it reflows so that the surface tension of all the balls just pulls it um, exactly into place. So they would have added this for uh, mechanical strength afterwards, either for uh, you know thermal cycling of the chip because this one and the other one are the two that have uh, the heatsink. That would just help uh, take the stress off the solder balls. It'll transfer the stress from the metal package to the PCB. That's the plan anyway. How effective that is, I don't know. Has anyone got data on that? Let us know. So this is where all the magic happens, the Xilinx Zinc Ultra Scale Plus, um, part number there. And this is 935 Yankee Bucks, one off on uh, Mousa, so it's pretty beastie. Um, of course, they're not uh, paying that, they get them in vo significant volume, but still, that'd be paying, you know, hundreds of dollars each uh, for this chip. And uh, we won't go into a huge amount of detail, but let's have a look what it's got. So it's got an ARM Cortex A53, and that's what they're using for the applications process on this thing. Um, it's uh, quad core or dual core um, up to 1.5 gig as well for the core so it's pretty schmicky. It's got a media processing engine and a floating point unit. Oh, an accelerator coherency port. <laughs> And all the application uh, memory will actually be inside of here as well. And it's also got a separate real-time processing unit RPU as well. And this is the block diagram that Tektronix uh, gave me. It doesn't tell a huge amount here, but basically, um, yeah, F FPGA. Is so they do mention the uh, RPU here, the real-time processing unit. So presumably they use that for... I don't know, like the screen updating or something like that, but they use the A53 core. It looks like they might use two of them. Um, and then, then we've got the EMMC um, uh, memory. Have a look in a second. Um, we've actually got a DDR4 
uh, memory on this sucker. So, I don't know, but yeah, like that's maybe the external memory controller down here. Maybe they haven't shown it. But basically the digital input comes straight through comparators into the FPGA. So that's going into the fabric. That all makes sense. It says there's a display um, engine in there, which is the one we uh, looked at. And it does everything else. It does the 1280 by 800 uh, display. Does this touch screen. Outputs to the wave gen. It does, it, it's all in that one chip. <laughs> There's some more detail, Mali 400 base GPU, everything else, DMA controllers, serial transceivers, oh, it's got everything. But let's have a look at the variant that we have because the variant you have determines the price. You can pay 10 times the price for a different variant that has 10 times the memory uh, and transistors on there. Uh, so yeah, there can be a huge difference. Anyway, so we've got the ZU4CG here, and that's that one there. 192,000 system logic cells, 175,000 flip floppies, lookup tables, 87,000. Oh, when I was a boy. And it's got 16, uh, 16 gigabits per second transceivers. Wow. And it can do like a PCI uh, Gen 3 times 16 interface as well. <laughs> So it's got 2.6 meg of uh, distributed RAM in there, uh, and it's got this ultra RAM as well. It's got 13 meg bits um, of ultra RAM. So I, they'd be using this internal memory for all of the uh, application memory and stuff like that. So that'd be running the Linux OS or whatever they're running in there, um, the application uh, memory and stuff like that. And they wouldn't be doing any sample memory in there because uh, there's 10 meg uh, samples plus the digital uh, ones as well. So we'll have a look at the external memory. So you can see the external memory here and it's Micron Jobby and we can decode that. They have a nice little uh, decoder on their website. Unfortunately, it's back like it's upside down. <laughs> All the electrons are going to fall out. Look, the FPGA code, FBGA code is on the bottom and they make you put it on the top here. I, it's, I, it's, no. Anyway, it's uh, this jobby down here and we've got the data sheet for that. And there you go. These are 512 meg bytes. But because this is an 8-bit scope, that's per sample, not including any like high res mode or anything like that. So 512 meg samples <laughs> per chip. We've got four chips, so that's two gig samples of memory. Hardware they got in here, but it's only 10 meg sample uh, memory that they've got. Of course, granted, you've got to have memory for uh, your digital uh, channels as well, because this is mixed signal, so you've got to get your four input uh, channels plus your 16, um, well, which is equivalent to another uh, two uh, channels, so effectively like six uh, channels, for example. And then you've got to allow for your uh, boxcar averaging mode as well, which gives you your higher resolution and stuff like that. So, but I, they seem to have a lot of memory left over, a lot of sample memory left over. So maybe they've designed it in so in the future they can be competitive, you know, five, ten years down the track when this scope is still selling, they want to be, uh, you know, they lack competition, all the competition's gone to 100 meg or something, maybe they can up it. Um, and they should be able to like reconfigure that if you don't have the digital turned on, you should be able to like get more sample memory. So there's two gig samples, not two gig bits, two gig samples of memory possible in the hardware on this thing. They only give you 10 meg samples, so uh, it's all about product positioning and where it fits in and they sort of like cripple, deliberately cripple the products, uh, pricing features and everything else, bandwidth to fit in, you know, they don't want to uh, eat away at the different levels of product that they got and every manufacturer does it. Uh. And down here, here's our eMMC memory that we uh, saw on the block diagram, and that's handling the application uh, part of stuff. So they're using the internal RAM here. They don't need any, uh, you know, program RAM. Uh, so that's all internal, but the program is running externally, and uh, that's where your firmware is, your flash update, everything else. And we've got a call for pricing. Oh, end of life. Scheduled for obsolescence and will be discontinued. Uh, maybe it's a slight, it's not the exact variant. Um, I'm sure they wouldn't have picked an obsolete part. <laughs> Let's have a look at the data sheet. Here we go, four gigabit EMC, EMMC, nothing special, meh, whatever. Anyway, we've got some uh, chunky bypassing around here, which you need for FPGAs when you boot these suckers up. They go... <laughs> and they gulp all your current, and if you don't uh, to get your bypassing right, I've mentioned this in previous videos, um, that, that's why Xilinx and other FPGA vendors have entire application notes, like 100 pages long, of how to power 
your FPGA. It's that important. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, we've got, you know, switch and converter over here, over here. That's a big-ass inductor there. Um, and then uh, this is our uh, VCO, is it? Anyway, suffice it to say that you do need a lot of stuff to power <laughs> this beast. So analog to digital converters, no custom uh, stuff, unlike what they have. I'll link in an application down below. I believe it's the Tech 049 acquisition um, engine, which has a custom, their own custom ASIC. Uh, we're on the higher end uh, models, on the 4 and above, not on the 3 series. I think the 3 series might use this same one. Don't quote me on that. But yeah, anyway, they're just using off-the-shelf uh, National Semiconductor Jobby, two of them here. Um, these are actually uh, dual ADCs um, to handle the four channels. So let's take a look at those. And they are ADC 08D 1520s, low power 8-bit dual 1.5 gig sample per second or single 3 gig sample per second AD uh, converter. So they're, they're dual, but they um, have to multiplex them. So if you want the faster rate, um, yeah, it's going to be used in both of them. Now, interestingly, the spec for this 2 Series is only 2.5 gig samples per second for the uh, single channel or two channel uh, configuration, um, or 1.25, half of that, of course, for the um, uh, four channel configuration where they uh, use the chip. Now, that's actually less than, that's significantly under um, the spec for this chip. They could actually do three gig samples per second. They're doing that for noise reasons, they're doing that for architecture sampling. Um, reasons, I like uh, processing um, all their existing software maybe to match their higher end um, series sample rates and stuff, don't know, but it's capable of a bit better. Applications, digital oscilloscopes, what a coincidence. So 7.4 uh, effective number of bits, that's what ENOB is, um, at 747, uh, 48 MHz um, input, so we've only got 500 MHz bandwidth, so it should actually do a bit better than that um, at 500 meg bandwidth, so that's not too shabby. And they only consume a maximum of uh, 2 watts here, so you can see why they didn't uh, really need to heatsink those, and they're running it at a lower uh, sample rate, so it's probably only, you know, chewing a watt, a watt and a quarter or something like that per device. There's the architecture there. They just uh, switch these puppies uh, and use both of them for if you want uh, double the sample rate. And LVDS uh, pairs, differential pairs, is what we um, saw on the output there. And you can see those differential pairs, as we mentioned, coming out of the uh, front end and going up there, snaking through. And this is interesting. Check this out. They've actually got a resistor and a cap in parallel on one, one big pad there. So I, I don't know, like... That I don't, they wanted to keep them close, nice and cosy. I, I don't know, it's pretty groovy though. <laughs> don't know if that'll be in the production version or not. And here's your external uh, trigger input here. So they've probably just got some like comparator action and stuff like that uh, going on there. Nothing fancy. Um, that'd be going straight into the FPGA. So this is our PLL here, our uh, clock generator for all this uh, business. I don't see the crystal on there. Is that on the bottom side? Anyway, that is this ultra low jitter network synchronizer, two frequency domains, blah, 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 blah. So that's what's generating all of our uh, sample clock. And because this is a lower end model, we're not going to have a uh, real precision crystal oscillator in there. Actually, where is the oscillator? I'm having a Stevie Wonder moment. And up in the top corner here, this is our uh, power external power input here. And uh, we've obviously got some uh, switching MOSFETs um, here. And that's about all she wrote. And the top side just had uh, that extra stuff over there. But yeah, there's not much doing. As far as the digital input here goes, uh, these are National Semiconductor jobbies, but uh, I don't know, it's got a weird ass SMD uh, part code on it, but uh, yeah, they're just uh, comparator um, inputs, so uh, programmable thread. I don't know if it has programmable threshold levels because I don't have the ability to enable the digital stuff to actually um, see on this thing. I'd have to, you'd have to RTFM on that sort of stuff. But yeah, um, it, the output of the comparators here just goes directly into the FPGA. So there you go, that's pretty much it for the teardown of the new Tektronix 2 series oscilloscope. And I really like the single board construction, how they've how they've constructed the whole thing and the thermals of it and stuff like that. I know there's a lot of people who complain that, oh, the battery should have been internal, but remember, it's not designed to be a tablet, it's designed to be a, a both a bench and a portable scope. So anyway, there's reasons that went into that. So, um, oh, I have to, oh, forgot. Tear down on the battery pack. Oh, hang on. 
And we'll do a quick teardown of the battery pack here. And I know uh, this will probably get uh, complaints uh, from people how it's too big. One of my uh, complaints is that it rattles. Um, so yeah, <laughs> anyway, once again, I've got a pre-production qualification build uh, and it could be um, different. Anyway, there's the battery in this thing. It does actually have a check on it. That's pretty groovy. Um, and of course, yes, these things are expensive, but you'll probably be able to get, uh, you know, third party ones once this comes out. I don't know if it's compatible with any other uh, Tektronix uh, products. Anyway, um, it is designed to be under the 100 watt hour limit, which is, I believe, the carry on uh, limit uh, for most aircraft so they deliberately uh, designed the capacity to be under that so um, yeah you can basically carry it with one battery in here and you can have one carry uh, one battery in your uh, carry-on bag so that's pretty groovy anyway you can see down in there like that they've got two batteries and you could say yeah it's all a big uh, waste of space and you know stuff like that but I do actually like um, how they've designed this to be like grip like that so you can just hold the thing like that but yeah once it's on the tablet it does make it pretty chunky anyway um, I do like the attention to detail here how I uh, mentioned that uh, this is the cover for the back of the oscilloscope they went to the effort to put um, a little cutout in there so that you can store it in there so you don't lose it winner and I thought that uh, pin was like an alignment uh, pin, but no, they, it actually makes uh, contact up there. So it's a like a big ass um, grounding pin and it makes contact first. That would be for uh, protection reasons. So yeah, nice touch there. Anyway, this should should lift off. Let's see what we've got in there. Um, yeah, pretty simplistic. A um, lot of wasted space, of course. Could they have designed it better? I don't know. Yeah. It's probably the best they could do uh, for removable batteries, and they wanted removable batteries because you can actually buy an optional <laughs> for a pretty penny, I'm sure, um, it, like a, a charging dock so you can have multiple batteries and stuff like this. And there are specific customers that'll just like drool over that, being able to like, you know, it's like having uh, those walkie talkies and you have like uh, the rechargeable battery packs and stuff like that. For those who need that sort of stuff for field use um it's just fantastic and having hot swappable batteries like this this would have been a big requirement from their uh customers uh, like you know a lot of their key customers um to do that so anyway there's the board down there doesn't that look groovy oh that's a linear tech jobby i think that's that's nice like just a dual board oh yeah it just lifts out sweet pull the battery out like that and these boards are just going to lift out like that ah oh. Isn't that fantastic? There you go. There's a quick look. That is a linear tech jobby. I won't go into details. Oh, it's a mod wire. It's a mod wire. Will that be in the production version? But as I said, as a qualification build, good old fashioned bodge there. <laughs> good work. It, uh, there you go. Like that's, that's a nice implementation. I like the right angled board like that. Oh, that's great. Oh, they've got double sided load. Jeez. What, you couldn't fit it all on the <laughs> backside there? Come on, the PCB layout engineer should have went, oh, I can fit all that on one side, no worries. But anyway, that is a very nice design. I, I really like that. Like, you know, and then these pieces just slot in there like that. Uh, like, the, the mechanical engineers, like, really had a good time with this one. Oh, and by the way, for those who don't want the uh, super funky stand, I, I swear if this was uh, had an Apple logo on it, it'd cost a thousand bucks. Um, it's, it's one of the highlights of this product is the uh, stand. So hats off to whoever designed that. Anyway, if you don't want the stand, if you want the good old fashioned uh, you know, like tilting bail um, kind of thing on it. They do actually have one. Now, mine is actually 3D printed. This is how uh, new it was when I got it. They hadn't even done the molding yet. So yeah, that just goes into the existing screws on the back. Uh, bleh, fell out. Um, goes the existing screws on the back and uh, yeah, you get a tilting bail. But that won't be 3D printed in the production. <laughs> Trust me. I'll mention this in the review video, but I really love these captive screws in here. It's just absolutely brilliant. And you can actually have it like gently sloping backwards like this by only putting in these two. If you put in the two bottom ones, then it's completely vertical. Or as I said, you can do the uh, tilting bail or you can even put it like that and you can actually have it um, designed sit uh, flat on a surface, either flat or slightly angled. It's very nice. And the sticky rubber stuff on the bottom is really good. Apparently it's the same magic material like you use on your um, shoe phone inside your car or something like that to like stick it. And when it's there, like it's really hard 
to make that budge. Like, it's real. Like, I'm really pushing, leaning all my body weight on that, and I can't shift it. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that teardown. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, discuss down below. As I said, high-res uh, photos of these over on my EEV blog Flickr account, link down below. And I've done, uh, there's two extra videos on my uh, second channel as well. One is a 40-minute talk with uh, Andy Ted, uh, who dropped off uh, this uh, scope uh, for me, um, hand-carried it uh, from the US. So we got to uh, chat with him before he had to hop on a plane. So that's interesting. And also my initial unboxing and first reaction of this thing because they did, deliberately didn't tell me they just said oh, i've got a new scope we're bringing it over and you can see my reaction when i open it so that's on my eev blog 2 channel catch you next time Hello.